Welcome to everyone uh, to the this plenary today. Uh, welcome to uh, the fifth week of the symposium, and we really appreciate your continuous engagement with us and and continuously participating in the sessions of the symposium. Um, so, as you know, this you know today we will um, talk about climate, masculinities, and justice, and, and the interconnections between them. So just before we jump in, we wanted to uh, run you through some few tech issues. Uh, so uh, this uh, you know, we, you know uh, session is being interpreted into Spanish, French, Russian, and English. So please, you need to choose the language of your preference, uh, meaning the language that you are comfortable with by uh, clicking on this you know, globe button on the bottom of your screen, and you will see the list of the, uh, uh, the languages that are available and you need to choose. Even if you, um, uh, you know, will use English, uh, you will have to choose English from the menu so that whenever someone speaks another language, you will continuously be hearing the English language uh, in your channel. So don't forget to do that. It's a small button that says interpreters uh, and then you will have to choose from there. This uh, session, as uh, other sessions, also is being uh, in a custom live uh, uh, as well, and it's ah! available, oops, uh, available in Wordly. So for that, you need to click the small bar up uh, in your screen. You see live on custom live solving service. Then if you click that, you'll have a ah! menu. Uh, I hear some disturbance there. Um, and, and from there, if you look at, uh, click on the view stream on custom live streaming services, it will take you to Wordly. And it provides, Wordly actually provides a computer generated translation. It will not be perfect, but it will give you a sense of what is being currently discussed and said in the session because it is automated uh, tra you know, uh, translation. It's, it's not very perfect but it uh, works okay and once you uh, open the worldly uh, you can set your uh, sort of screen like this where you can see the video and and the live interpretation that is happening there uh, and then uh, you know, the lang the languages you can choose in the worldly are additional uh, actually total 18 different languages which are listed here and you need to select the language that you choose from the menu there as well also, uh, don't forget to follow if you are on social media or, uh, and, and using social media to um, you know, spread messages that is being discussed and using the hashtag Ubuntu Symposium so that we can uh, you know, connect with the rest of the conversations that are happening around Ubuntu Symposium. So today, as, as I said, or uh, you know, as you know, the session is on climate crisis, men and climate justice. It is the first part of the eight series that we will have continuously once a month moving forward until uh, uh, June or towards the end of the symposium. So the focus for today is on voices from women and girls leading the feminist climate justice movement and what they have to say to, um, to us, or those especially working on. And just a reminder that the the themes for this symposium are these five strong, you know, uh, which we call the frameworks, the feminisms, accountability, power with transformation and intersectionality. And we will be touching on, on all of these elements as we move forward in the sessions. <coughs> Before I pass it on to Vidal, just a minute um, on, on why we are doing this uh, uh, session is actually the realization that was, you know, um, uh, you know, which uh, some of you typed in the chat box as well, that we are in an existential crisis situation at the moment and we need to act immediately in terms of addressing uh, the issue around. Um, and also the fact that we have realized that, you know, not, you know, so looking at uh, the climate um, is ex extremely important and we are the generations to know what we are capable uh, in terms of undermining the Earth's ecosystem and most likely the last generation with the ability to do something as well. And again, global warming, the climate issues and so on, uh, the gender dimensions of climate crisis are well documented and well known. And in particular, 
looking at the roles and responsibilities of boys and men. And, and we, we developed this discussion paper, and this is one of the priority areas for meaning is moving forward to you know, make the interconnections on why the work around transparent masculinity is extremely important in relation to climate. Uh, and we you know, established the rationale for understanding men and boys, you know, multiple responsibilities and relationship with climate change and doing this from a male and masculinity uh, lens uh, or doing the analysis from a male and masculinity lens and uh, looking at how men and boys need to step up. And this paper actually puts a lot of questions rather than answers. So this is the quest that we are jumping in now with support from Vidar and colleagues to really unpack what that means for us moving forward. So with this now, I will now hand it over to Vidar for the rest of the sessions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Laxman. Um, so I will try to share my screen. Um, it's very nice to see all your faces. <laughs> um, just a second. Um, yeah, I think I something strange coming here. Uh, yeah, can you see my screen now? Yes, great. Okay. Um, yes, so very, very warmly welcome, everybody. Um, as Laxman shared, this is a series, and this is the first kickoff session for the series. And we have an agenda here. Uh, we start with the welcoming and introduction and some instructions for the session. And then we have a presentation by Tramita um, with voices of women leading feminist climate justice grassroots movements in Asia Pacific for a feminist fossil fuel free future. And after that, we will do some reflections in small groups. And that is pretty much the first hour. And then in, we have a second round with presentations, voices from Fridays for Future, and research on climate denial and masculinities. And we do some reflections there as well. And in the end, we will think together, what would we like to have in this series that we have in front of us? We have, as organizers, we have some several ideas, but uh, we, we uh, consciously leave, leave it a bit open so that you can so that we can co-create it together. Care is central in all of this. Um, and um, we are co-creating this series together with many fantastic organizations. We have um, the youth organization from Bangladesh. We have Fridays for Future globally. We have Sonke Gender Justice, and we have Men Care Global, and men engage. And I come from the organization Men in Sweden. And Sonke Gender Justice and Men Care, they are having a parallel Ubuntu series uh, focusing on the politics of care. And here is one or two sentences. Caring about something means you can see it and that you pay attention to it. You need to see something and care about it before you can take care of it. And then later comes give care and receive care. And, and in this series, uh, and Vessel, maybe you can post in the chat the links to, to that series um, so people can join that as well. Um, here we are looking at how can we as men engage uh, pay attention to climate justice um, and, and become aware of it more and from there see um, that when we, when we have started to care about it, then maybe we can find ways to take care of it together with the women and the girls and all others um, who are in the front lines doing all the work for gender justice and climate justice. Um, so this we will bring with us um, 
in the session today. And the series that we have in front of us starts today, and then here are some save the dates. And as you can see, there is about one per month. There's none in January, but uh, two in April. So, And in June the 3rd, one goal is expressed by Laxman and the Secretariat of Men Engage Global that we there form a Men Engage working group for climate justice. Um, so we're building up to that. Um, and parallel to these seminars, we also have a deepening process uh, starting in January um, where we use uh, the guide for reflective groups, and which is called Men in the Climate Crisis, that MEN has developed together with Chalmers, a technical university in Sweden, and with um, Under the Pine Trees, which is a ecological garden. Um, that is a material that is available in English, Russian, and Swedish so far. But when we do this process, there is a possibility to participate, or you can also co-facilitate or even facilitate. We will do a little training in January for those who want to be facilitators as well. We'll come back to that more later. We always work with the small room and the big room. And um, because the political is personal and the personal is political, it's not possible to work with only one of them when we work for gender justice and for climate justice. And we will, during this session today, we will move between those two rooms. Um, we'll come back more to that later when we move into the small room and the breakout rooms. We have very clear rules for how to, to create those rooms in a safe and brave way. Here are some symbols just illustrating the kind of logic mindset um, where we have the ecological and the industrial breadwinner masculinities, which Martin Hultmann and Paul Poulet call them, who are researchers from Chalmers University in Sweden. Um, it's the fossil, the old fossil norms where men are at the top and we're uh, using everything underneath and the earth and the nature and humans are there to grab and use for ecological, egoistic uh, needs. Mm. The green one is the same structure, but there we, we somehow realize that there are some challenges and problems with the climate, with the environment. We need to do something about it. So maybe we have different ideas of technical solutions um, we just do more wind power and electric cars and then we can just move on as we always do. We don't need to change the system, we can just keep on going a bit greener. And the third one is what we call the ecological uh, system and this ecological order where we are all together in one ecosystem. It's no my needs are strongly connected and interdependent with everybody else's needs. Here is gender equality, here is cooperation, here is abundance of, of energy and, and richness. The two systems to the left, there is, there is um, uh, lack of things. Uh, it's, it's organized in a way that you want to consume to try to get happy or get up higher up in the top. And a lot of energy is used to keep this order because it's human or man-made orders. They, have, they don't have much to do with reality. So we need all the weapons, we know, need all the, the drugs, we need all the expensive stuff to keep this in order. Um, the ecological system um, is a new, is an old story that we need to retell and re and find again, and how we create it. And it's so closely linked to 
gender equality and climate justice. Um, that's some images. Um, so how can we move from ego to eco, from patriarchy to partnership? And how can we engage more men in the transition? I'll just mention those uh, right now. And uh, we will today listen to the voices of the women. And here are some key questions for the series of seminars. Um, I won't read them through now. I want to give the floor to Trimita Shakman, who is an independent feminist researcher with over 10 years of experience in campaigning for women's human rights. And she's worked with over 80 grassroots communities across 20 countries in the Asia Pacific for climate justice and a feminist fossil fuel free future. Welcome Trimita, it's great to have you here. Thank you, everyone. I hope you can hear me and see me. Right. Hi. So um, today I'm going to talk about um, the feminist movement, the feminist movements from the global south, and how they're tackling the issue of climate change um, at the forefront. So I used to work for an organization called Asia Pacific Forum on Women, Law, and Dis uh, but uh, the fruits of my work are still, um, you know, developing. So there is this paper that um, I co-authored with some of the activists, and uh, to today's presentation will focus on on the findings from that paper. So I'll share my screen. Give me one moment. I just want to clarify that um, um, that I, I wouldn't say I'm an expert in climate in, on the issue of climate justice. It's a massive topic. Uh, but my uh, my involvement in the movement comes more from feminist research perspective. So this one particular feminist methodology called feminist participatory action research. Um, so the paper actually focuses on how this is um, a very effective effective tool in uh, in in fostering climate justice activism and making it um, sort of the yeah facilitating it, fostering it, and um making the research tools available for for the most marginalized i suppose right because research can also be quite hierarchical it is also gendered and it, it is also um uh, there there is power imbalance within research so i will um start timing myself very briefly <laughs> don't want to go over time and uh, so what does it mean climate change when we say there is climate change in the global south um so I think this particular quote summarizes it um, because we may not see these impacts so um, strongly in the global north yet, but it's quite visible in, in the global south, the southern hemisphere of the planet, right? And we do have a speaker from Bangladesh, my fellow <laughs> countrymate. We are drowning and, and some of the islands in the Pacific area already drowned, but I don't think people follow or know what's happening, right? So it is the devastating reality for millions of women in the global south, typhoons, flash floods, landslide drought, rising sea levels, unpredictable water access and weather patterns, um, and large scale displacement, crop loss, you name it. So this is what it means in the global south when we talk about climate change. Um, and then the analysis of, is that climate change often compounds and fuels existing inequalities and chronic mar marginalization of women. Uh, so this is from a from another climate justice FPAR, uh, the first one. I was also involved in that one back in 2013 to 15. So you can read that, I have uh, linked it here. Um, so just to give you a brief background of the organization that I was involved in for last seven, eight years, um, it's a leading feminist uh, network of feminist organizations and also individual activists in Asia Pacific. And they work in 27 countries and has uh, this membership, massive membership network, but it's known for its political activism, right? And, um, and it's outreach to the grassroots. Um, and uh, APWLD does a lot of um, advocacy for influencing laws, policies with, uh, at all levels, local, national, international levels um, uh, to promote 
well, to advance the feminist agenda. There will be some conceptual uh, discussions in my, in my presentation, and there will also be a connection to these conceptual ideas um, to, the, to the practice and, and to the ground. And I think this connection is really important. Um, so APWLD developed this feminist manifesto for climate justice back in 2016, which um, it stemmed from the recognition for the struggles of our members that were fighting against dirty energy and mining projects. And of course, it's just not, I mean, mining in the mining, it's mostly the men who work in the mines, but the projects um, themselves, they affect the women, right? The communities around it. Um, so F feminist fossil fuel free future or five Fs, it, it, it's nice as five Fs. Um, it's an alternative development model to ensure new gender just economic, political, and social rela relationships in the world free from climate change. It's a massive framework. So I will walk you through and don't worry if you don't absorb everything uh, in a few minutes because it took us forever to develop this with our members. Uh, it is a holistic approach uh, to an alternative development model than, than, than the capitalist economic model that we have now. Um, so there are seven core principles. Um, the first one is a just and equitable transition, right? So from fossil fuel, from a fossil fuel world to a to a sustainable, um, you know, fossil free world. So how can that transition be just? Because there are so many people working in the energy industry, right? So that discussion uh, came about that we need to move this workforce, millions of people who work in mining um, or other fossil fuel industries, we need to train them and move them and give them jobs in the clean energy uh, industry as we move. Um, and also to recognize that the energy sector itself is also very gendered. Uh, there are very few women working in the current fossil fuel industry but in, in the new one that we will have, the fossil free and clean energy, we need to have more employment for women, right? So that is the idea of just an equitable transition. Um, energy and resource democracy, where it talks about decentralizing how we produce energy and who gets to use that energy, right? So we will look at an example uh, of an energy solution that appears to be clean energy but then how it actually impacts um, the grassroots uh, communities negatively. Um, I hope I'm making sense. Please take notes if you have any questions. Um, and how we use energy usually uh, is not a democratic decision. Often it's just like very large coal projects and, and nobody asks how we want to utilize our energies. And energy democracy itself is, a, is one of the key areas of the climate justice uh, field. Um, Agroecological farming practices. Um, so basically, you know, like how we are, we have capital, capitalized the food production market. Uh, so going back to having food sovereignty, sub, supporting subsistence farming, uh, and decentralizing, uh, and getting rid of all this GMO, etc. Uh, dismantle all trade rules within and outside of WTO. Uh, very political. Um, because the free trade agreements and the mega free trade agreements that see that they have these really problematic provisions on intellectual property rights um, that that gives more power to the corporations and often corporations that run fossil fuel companies. Um, so we need to dismantle these kind of rules that that hinders us from you know moving toward a fossil fuel free um, industry. Because some of the developing countries, even if they want to. Uh, become, you know, more, use more sustainable energies, they cannot because they're bound by these trade agreements. Uh, so there is this, you know, in countries as well. Uh, sourcing public, public finance, um, it talks a lot, a lot about progressive taxing uh, to, uh, for this transition, right? Because even with the, during this corona crisis, we see whenever a crisis hits, not just climate, it's corona, or even the financial crisis hit, we see the, rich, the richest are getting richer uh, because it doesn't affect them. Uh, so we, we are saying, oh, we can finance this transition by taxing the 
uh, you know, the billionaires and um, uh, and getting rid of all these uh, tech, tax havens and so on. Um, investment in public commons. So when you have the tax money, we should invest in, in public services, right? And we should have a social wage and it also talks about gender equitable uh, participatory democracy. So these are the principles. It sounds a bit theoretical, but the thing is to fight climate change, which, which is a massive challenge, we cannot do it in silos. It's, it, we have to have a whole change the entire system uh, in order to fight climate change. Um, what I want to say is that the, the organization, the APWLD, its mandate for climate change is political because climate the issue of climate there is no there is no unpolitical way of facing the climate crisis it is completely political so APWLD already had a, had a political analysis that you know i mean what is the key goal of feminist movements right we are trying to dismantle patriarchy so it's a patriarchy big word but what does it mean um, so the, the, the thesis is that patriarchy is supported by three elements. Uh, one is globalization, right? GFM, um, fundamentalisms, different forms of fundamentalisms. For example, nationalism can also be a fundamentalism, but we, we know more about the religious fundamentalisms and militarism. So we are saying patriarchy has these three pillars and it's supported by these. So we have to dismantle these, these other pillars in order to challenge patriarchy. And I'm sure we can later on connect it to how that um, manifests all sorts of, all forms of masculinities as well, right? Uh, so the, this power structure of patriarchy, uh, we need to build and sustain feminist movements that are autonomous. That's, that's the only way to, the best way to challenge this power. And in order to do that, uh, the movements need four, four things. Therefore, we work in these four areas. And these four areas are that we need to build capacities of our movements. Uh, we need to generate new knowledge, new tools, and new resources. We need to engage, create advocacy spaces, and also engage in these advocacy spaces so we can change laws, policies, and so on. And often we, we do it, it, these are all interconnected, right? We need to build our capacity for us to be able to engage. And we also need to produce new knowledge to be able to influence policies. And the movement architecture is a structure for the movement. For example, main, main Engage Alliance is probably a structure, right? So we need an architecture to be formed. So often it could be new women's group being formed, or if you are a membership network, your membership expands, or it could be cross-movement solidarity building. So I think in today, for example, one of the things I guess we are trying to figure out how can we build solidarity between feminist men movements than feminist women movements and how can we find the common goal, right? So movement, that, that would be a new form of move, movement architecture for us to develop that allyship. So the climate justice work that we have done, it sits within all these theories that I've just discussed, right? Uh, we, are, we are trying to achieve a feminist fossil fuel free future using those eight princip core principles we want to influence. Um, and that we are trying to strengthen feminist movements and we are trying to, you know, work on those four areas through the climate justice FPAR. And I think it's really important that there is no fighting climate change without addressing the power difference um, between the global North and the South at the moment, the political power. Uh, and that uh, we always, always will, um, um, Hold, <laughs> hold the global north or the industrial countries responsible for the historical responsibility for the carbon they've emitted and, and you know. Uh, so some of the poorest countries in the world that are drowning, they have contributed next to nothing to climate change, but they're, you know, they're bearing the brunt. For example, Papua New Guinea. Uh, so it's not fair, right? Therefore the idea of justice, because it's unfair, we want the fairness, we want it to be just. Um, and therefore we have to uh, demand an end to patriarchy and climate capitalism. Uh, and we have to have a uh, you know, system of accountability and we should have a system for redressing for all the injustice that has happened historically and so on. So the system change is really important in climate justice. 
Um, so I will come, I will not go too much into the details of what makes a research feminist. Uh, but for us, these are the nine principles. This is, these, are the, these are the elements that distinguish a research from being feminist to traditional, because traditional feminist research has been criticized by feminist scholars and activists as being also hierarchical, unaccessible, and so on. And it is also dominated by, you know, there's a global north and global south imbalance. Most research, uh, formal research is produced in the US, for example, and also by men, yeah. Uh, so who produces knowledge and who who decides what is valid and invalid is another discourse. Uh, so I will quickly read the, because it's you know, a short, short of, a lot of time. So quickly read the nine principles because it's important to understand. Uh, the, the reason why the feminist participatory action research works in building movement is because it is focused around um, bringing a structural change. Uh, it, focuses on amplifying women's voices. It focuses on uh, the research being owned by the community, not by this one researcher, you know, coming in, taking the knowledge and going away and going to conferences. Uh, it takes an intersectional approach and aims to shift power and it fosters movement building and collective action, uh, builds capacity of all, including the community, the, anybody involved, the donor uh, and so on. Uh, and it involves free prior informed consent uh, and it also prioritizes safety, care, and solidarity uh, for women, between women, among women. So it's a it's a quick checklist for <laughs> sort of a evaluation checklist for us as well. You know that uh, when we do research, these things need to happen, and these are also um, the elements we use for reflecting throughout the research journey. So this research uh, program uh, went on for two years, uh, 2017 to 2019, and uh, it's called Climate Justice Feminist Participatory Action Research Program. And the theme this time was climate induced displacement. So I will quickly walk you through three cases. Um, there were nine countries, uh, partners from nine countries that participated and they're listed here, mostly from of course, Asia. Uh, no one from Pacific this time. So going over quickly, um, I think I picked three cases uh, with three themes to highlight three themes. This one is um, women in the Northeast, uh, India, and uh, in 12 villages, and their challenge is adapting to their livelihoods, uh, their livelihoods to climate change. So this theme would be adaptation, right? And you can see the women. Uh, I have a lot of images to give you an idea of what, what these people look like at the forefront. Um, so their issue is that there, there is basically climate is changing. There is erratic rainfall, flooding, erosion, and seasonal weather change, and so on. So they are an agricultural community, so they depend on farming and natural resources. So these are depleting, and therefore they have no income source. Uh, so you can see what's happening is uh, the men are migrating uh, to find work in, another, in other states because there is no, not enough money um, they cannot earn enough money through agricultural activities. Uh, and also companies and investors are also buying land uh, because, you know, they can. <laughs> and so what happens is um, in this region, the men leave and then the women become head of the household and the sole earners and carers for children and elders. And that increases their uh, domestic and agricultural burden. So this is an uh, issue. This is a gendered issue. Um, so poverty, uh, because also they cannot own, they do not own land or resources. They are, you know, uh, being taken over by the corporates, um, and and they have to borrow, rise. They have to take loans, and they incur, you know, occur, in, yeah, accrued debt and so on. Um, and the other, uh, in you know, sort of relay relay impacts are they also they are having lower nutrition intake uh, and so on, and they don't have healthcare facility. Um, to address those issues. So what these women did uh, through the feminist participatory action research over, over the course of two years, uh, they mobilized uh, uh, to participate in decision-making. So they influenced their local government. Uh, and uh, I mean, I listed some ideas like they wanted distribution monetary support for the girl child and 
village development plan. So they wanted to be included in decision making. So due to their activism, um, now they're invited to the public hearings for their inputs. Um, and through their activism, they were also able to get uh, support from the government to create a yarn bank. So yarn is like the strings and they use for weaving. So they, they, they're getting support from the government so they can weave, which would be their alternative livelihood from you know, farming um, and so on. So this is what they have done and these are the women. Um, so there was a case of how women are adapting to the climate change issues by creating alternative livelihood and finding a local solution through engaging with the local government. In Myanmar, this is uh, an, an indigenous community called Hakatar. Uh, so this is a case of displacement due to a, a natural disaster, which is Cyclone Komen in 2015. So they have been resettled in, in another area in, in the Chin state of in, near the capital, right? So then in that settlement, they have issues. So the settlement area lacks infrastructure, doesn't have roads, housing, uh, that, and they don't have you know, any regular income source. Uh, so they have to find alternative work and so on. Um, so they are highly trained in agriculture because they are also an agricultural community. They're dependent on natural resources, but the resettlement area is sort of you know, near the city. Uh, so they don't have access to land to farm. So now they have to find other income sources. So they, they are becoming, I guess, what happens in the urban, urban informal work is they would become domestic workers and so on, or work in factories. So that would be also another form of impact of globalization as well. This is where it, it, it sort of intersects. Uh, yeah, so they have a lot of health problems because of the poor waste management pollution and so on, because the new settlement is not, doesn't have infrastructure. And it is also a, a very conservative Christian community. So they don't have, uh, because of that, they don't have equal rights to make decisions or actually own property as well. In the, in the Chin indigenous community, women don't have the right to own property as per their traditional law. So they formed, so they worked on, you know, that remember that domain with the uh, architecture, movement architecture. So they formed their organization with 400 members and co um, collaborated with other groups in this in the Chin state, other, other ethnic minorities. Um, and uh, they, yeah, I think they influenced the state authorities. Uh, in the end, what because of their organization, the state has given them a piece of land where they built this office. So I think this is a big win, like having access to land uh, for a community that don't have the right to own land, um, the women. This one is a case of, so we saw that was a displacement due to a climate disaster. Uh, this one is a displacement due to building a hydro dam. So hydro dams are often labeled as clean energy projects, right? Green solutions. Uh, but these projects are also sort of led by corporations and a lot of Chinese investors. And so we, so in the feminist movement, we call some of these, we call them false solutions to climate change because it's not actually addressing uh, the people's, people who are at the forefront, it's making it worse for them. So these, these, these indigenous women are resisting this forceful displacement due to, due to construction of this dam in Vietnam. Oh, no, sorry, Cambodia. The investor is from Viet Chinese Vietnam. Wow, interesting. Um, so you can see the picture of the community. Uh, the dam was constructed to provide electricity to five provinces in Cambodia and excess electricity would be sold to neighboring countries. So what it did was it blocked two rivers and wetlands and destroyed basically the area the, these, these communities were living in. And they did, and it, these are indigenous communities. They're, indigenous people have the right to, uh, this thing is called FPIC, free prior, in, free prior informed consent. So that was not practiced because there was no discussion uh, for this plan of building the dam. So you can see what has happened is a uh, flood. I mean, this is dam water. So um, some villagers were forcefully, forcefully relocated 
and 20% were resisting. So this community is the one that resisted. So they, they decided to remain and this is, it went underwater and this is how they live. This is a, a worship place, which is also a right to their culture, practicing their culture. Um, so it, it drowned their forest deities, cemetery and blocked. It divided the communities into two groups. You can see. Uh, and, and the remaining communities still facing threats from military and state because they're not, you know, they're resisting. And, and, the, and the villagers that were relocated, they are also having infrastructure issues like the Hakatar community in Myanmar. Um, they don't have access to water, uh, school, electricity, food, uh, terrible situation. Livelihoods were destroyed and all because you know, the, the government and the co in collaboration with the companies they decided to build that dam. Uh, so these women, um, also mobilized through the and through through the FR uh, work activism uh, and they are um, participating in decision making. Uh, sorry, yeah. So I think they they also engaged in uh, in future development uh, future plans for dam projects in in the area. Yeah. So they are just building more space for decision making. I remember that they also, uh, this community that was relocated, they advocated for, for all these services from the government and these are under, under um, development at the moment. Uh, so I don't have time to cover all the other countries, but uh, I just put the outcomes. For example, in Pakistan, uh, they have massive uh, pollution issues. So. Uh, so they they were planting like hundreds of trees because of the pollution they had they were having health issues so they they hold the local industries accountable uh, to reduce emissions and car pollution uh, in Nepal they they ask for a gender budget and, and have a voice in how that budget should be allocated for environment projects in Nepal and and in Nepal Sri Lanka Thailand Vietnam they all engaged with uh, you know climate related policy developments. Uh, development um, projects with their governments. Um, before I go into key challenges, I want to say that um, the reason why this work was, remember the theory of change? So we are working across a theory of change where we had to build capacity, like huge capacities because climate change is a technical subject topic. But these women are at the forefront and they don't know. and. So the capacity building is really important so they can relate that all, all the challenges they're facing are actually related to the event of climate change. So once they can connect those dots, they become quite active with their governments to uh, ask for you know, um, change. Um, so they did, they did work on those all four areas. They, the capacities were built, um, they generated new knowledge, tools and resources, and this is a participatory tool. You can see they're voting using stones. Some of them cannot count more than 10, therefore. Uh, so there are tools that are more become more accessible for grassroots groups. Um, they engage, all of them engage with some sort of advocacy, local or national level or international event, some. And, and they build, you know, they strengthen their movements through uh, building new or strengthening their movement architectures. So the key challenges, um, I think I, I picked two highlights. One is that the women's burden of domestic and care work just leave them with no extra time for activism, right? Uh, so women's time has always been the biggest challenge and most women face, uh, it's called time poverty. Uh, so even though we want the, re want the research project to be very participatory, we have to be very uh, conscious of the time we're asking for the women. So they have to be motivated to own the research in order to engage. Um, and then come, this comes with patriarchal attitudes. This, this, was the, this is the biggest challenge. Um, uh, for example, they, the women are always facing resistance from authorities as they want to engage in, in advocacy. Uh, and some government officials, which are usually males, they would refuse to talk, uh, especially if these are marginalized, uneducated women, uneducated in inverted comma. Um, and so, so this is when the masculinity gets in the way of, of the work they want to do, right? Uh, these patriarchal attitudes. 
Um, and in some places where it is very difficult to challenge patriarchy because it's you know, challenging power, it becomes quite dangerous to work as well. So I cannot name the country or the group because you know of safety, but you can understand um, like they would receive harassment, uh, they, would, they would risk harassment and threat for doing this kind of work. Um, and there, there were even uh, there was even a case of honor killing um, because this one woman who was uh, engaged in the research wanted to go to school, and uh, you know, you know, became disobedient, and and therefore anyway, it was really sad. Um, so we, men become quite concerned uh, about being overpowered by women when women become empowered through the uh, you know the feminist research process. So I will read this quote in the community, the males who are so much accustomed with mindset that only men can be leaders are getting worried, frustrated, and uh, when observing the current uh, climate justice FPAR activities in their communities. Some even attack the participants personally. So men are feeling threat because women are becoming empowered, you know, the subjugation and so on um, that keeps them in their position. So it is, I think, a good uh, point for discussing the toxic masculinity and how it is ingrained. Uh, okay, so I would like to apologize because I don't have a lot of ideas here because uh, I, I don't have a lot of experience working with male, male allies in the climate justice area because we, we focus on, on women's groups. Um, but I think in, in my personal experience as a feminist, when I engage with men in general, uh, and, and then because I claim to be a feminist, et cetera, somehow I am always asked to educate them, you know, tell them. And, and then if I say something and I am asked to provide all sorts of evidence and do the research and homework for them. And so it gets really annoying because like my time is precious <laughs> and I don't want to spend it educating privileged men um because you know they have education so they can go do it themselves do the research to learn so i think uh, the political education on feminist climate justice concepts uh, could be one thing you know uh, that our male allies can do to help because it's really difficult for women to do that we don't have time plus um, men don't listen to us um, and recognizing false solutions because it's really easy to fall for that trap uh, especially like geothermal projects hydro large hydroelectric um, dams, we should always ask who is benefiting from those those projects and whether corporations are involved, uh, right? Uh, and then we need to ask for a just and equitable transition away from fossil fuels and demand our governments to be accountable with the climate policies. Yeah, how are we allowing this massive, um, you know, this massive knowledge of scientific evidence out there about climate change? and our politicians are still in denial. How are we allowing that, right? It has to be some sort of, some form of ego and toxic masculinity that allows you to do that. And we need to finance a small scale community-based sustainable energy projects. And you have seen the research projects we have done, they were over two years, I think we only spent $12,000. Yeah, I think uh, that's the end of my presentation. I hope I didn't take too much time. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Trimita. Wonderful. Wow. Thank you, thank you. Um, oh, I <clears throat> start crying. Um, uh, I want now. I want us now to to go into small groups, and it's only for a short time, and we will do it with strict rules. Uh, and before we go into to groups, you need to rename yourself. So you go, you point with the arrow on your own video um, where your name is or where your image is, and you click on the three points, and then you get the option to rename. And there you click on rename, and you write your name, and then the language you speak, if it's English, Russian, French, or Spanish. That will help uh, us to divide into groups where we meet people who speak the same language. 
and I would like us to go into groups of four. And we have strict rules now for this, and I will show you the rules. We have timekeeping. We have, uh, yeah, we're a bit um, uh, behind schedule with a slow start in the beginning. So um, we will have only like one and a half minute each to share. And you choose a timekeeper in your own group and you actually set the alarm on your phone or the clock you have. Uh, one and a half minute and then you take turn. One is talking at the time and you focus on listening. That's the ear. So you really focus on listening to the person who's sharing. And when you are sharing yourself, you're listening to yourself. You don't try to be smart and deliver some nice um, smart things. You actually go to yourself and, and, and share what's, what's, what's there uh, in you. So that's also the symbol of the heart. We are now we are in the little room. This is about me. This is about heart and stomach. It's not so much about head. It's more about the personal experience. And then the last image is uh, illustrating that we are what is shared in the little room stays in the little room. So we don't tell others about it. What others have said, uh, others have said you can share <laughs> to others what you what you shared in the little room, but not what others said. Um, and you will get a question here with you into the little room. Um, this is the question and it connects back to the question of care. So what do I feel and think when I listen to Trimita? And to listen is to give your attention to, to, to care about something. So basically what happens in me when I care about this? And you have one and a half minute to share something about that to the others. And then you give the word to the next person in the little group. Okay. So is it possible to get us all into small rooms now, breakout rooms. Is there any question to the to this? How are we going to do this? Who is putting us into small rooms, breakout rooms? Is it is it happening? <laughs> It's happening. Amilan, are you doing this breakout room? Oh. Tamilan, are you supporting the breakout? Uh, give me a second. Oh, sure. So I can just clarify a bit more then. So what the invitation here is really to listen to each other and to feel and, and to go to yourself and really feel. When I listened to Trimita, what did I feel and what did I think? When I allow myself to give attention to all this and really listen and care about this, what happens in me? Then there is another question below as well, which is the next step in care is to actually take care of something. So maybe something comes up. What, what would I like to take care of and how? What does it inspire me to do? But you can save that question for later if you want. <clears throat> hmm. Sorry, this is... Not so quick. Hmm. Uh, can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. 
So uh, I don't see everyone uh, with a language in their name. So if they can rename themselves, it will be great for me to assign. Okay. Yes, I see. And and I realize now that we will. I think we are a bit behind schedule. So we we I think we will actually skip going into little little rooms now. We will do it later. I invite you to write in the chat, please. Okay. Something. To, to answer to this question. What do I feel and think when I listen to Trimita? Let's take one and a half minute where everybody can write at the same time, or we can, we can give it three minutes. And just write whatever comes up in you. This is not about being smart or deliver something. Just speak from your heart. And if you've finished writing, you can read what others have written. <clears throat> yeah, there we have three minutes. We stop there now. And we've been here for an hour now. So I invite you to now stretch a little bit and move your body. And I will actually turn on some music and we will dance a little bit if you want to. Um, you can stand up if you want or you just sit and dance or you give it some seconds of just moving Ah, at least that brought in some breathing into my body. Um, I give the floor now to Katrin, uh, who will both share an own presentation and being my co-host um, um, and mod co-moderator, uh, moderating the next part of the session. Please, Katrin. Yes, um, good afternoon, everybody. 
I hope the sound is okay. Uh, so welcome to this uh, to this seminar. And um, uh, this part of the seminar, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the climate movement and more specifically the youth climate movement that emerged the Fridays for Future uh, movement that was uh, and that is still is led by uh, Gre Greta Thunberg. Um, and um, and then we will have uh, a little bit deeper into the harassment that uh, some of these girls who were leading the movement, and specifically Greta herself, have uh, received. Uh, I'm going to start by giving a little uh, introduction myself, because I happen to be the mother of one of the girls who started the movement along with uh, Greta. So Greta obviously was the first stepping outside uh, in Sweden, out of school, and um, uh, and to uh, uh, to sit in front of the parliament, uh, but she was quickly followed by other, um, mainly girls in Europe, and I'm the mother of one of them, the one from Belgium, whose name is Anuna uh, de Wever. So I'm going to start by sharing my own screen, and um, so the host should give me uh, the permission to share. Um, Yes, so if I can get permission to share my screen from the host, then yes. You have the permission. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you very much. So there you are, because I've, I've made a little PowerPoint presentation as an introduction. Now, all, the, all of the things that I'm going to say now is that I'm going to go through this really quickly. But the good news is that we've got seven more seminars coming up on this topic. And so one of the things that Vidar and I wanted to do today with you is to sort of touch on all the subjects that link the two, the men engage topic with the climate movement topic. And then we like to listen at the end of this workshop from you, which of these topics you think would be really worthwhile to dig deeper into on the upcoming seminars. So, I'll just do this quick and dirty, but just to give you an idea. So up until quite recently, we were an anonymous family and I enjoyed life with my three daughters and you see all three of them here. But then one of them had an idea and this is the one, her name is Anuna de Wever and she had heard about what Greta was doing and she felt horrible the idea that Greta was sitting there all alone in front of the parliament and she, she said she needs to get support. So I will do the same in Belgium and she organized a school strike. But the difference was that she posted a little video and she called on other students to come and join her. And um, so on the first strike, and we have absolutely did not think this would happen, uh, she drew 3,000 students to Brussels. The week after, 10,000. And that continued like that for 20 straight weeks, up until the elections at the end of May. Uh, so she started in January up until May. Imagine every Thursday, in this case, she would do the strike uh, in Brussels. Immediately, it became headline news in Belgium because it was the biggest youth, uh, you know, activist movement that surfaced since the 1960s. So we ha hadn't had that for the past 60 years in Belgium. And especially the fact that it was led by a young, uh, at that time, 17-year-old girl was uh, uh, completely exceptional and unexpected. And initially, and this is also one very interesting topic, I think, and, and I discussed this with Anuna, and she's very fine with the fact that I'm talking about this today with all of you. Initially, the leadership was all feminine and mostly lesbian. So Anuna, uh, she's born anatomically as a girl, but she was raised as a boy, uh, being transgender. And currently, she, she uh, puts herself in a non-binary uh, situation, but I'm allowed to continue to use she and her to address her. So she's in the right picture there. Um, the girl next to her is the girl from the French speaking part from Belgium. Um, and so it, it was very interesting. And I think it cannot be called a coincidence that it was all feminine, but also from mostly lesbian uh, leadership, uh, because I think these girls had already uh, faced the world with being different from everybody else and trying to they create a safe space wherein they could develop their own uh, um, uh, uh, sexuality and sexual orientation, which was lesbian, which was different than what the norm is in society. And definitely, I think, being the mother of Anuna and having seen this up close when she developed 
I'm very sure that this has strengthened her in her climate activism. The fact that she was one of the first in her school to come out about uh, openly about being lesbian, paving the way there. Uh, uh, and, and being confronted with a lot of resistance in trying to establish a safe space for lesbian girls in her school, later on helped her enormously when she got into this uh, uh, climate movement. Interestingly enough, when I started to talk about them, uh, about this, because I'm a gender expert myself, and I thought it was really, you, it couldn't be a coincidence that all the top girls in the movement uh, were also lesbian and belonging to or, or various variously be belonging to the LGBTQI community, let's put it like that. Interestingly, they themselves perceived it as irrelevant. They, they sort of said, yeah, that, but that doesn't have anything to do with climate. And, um, and it's, uh, you know, they, they didn't even think it was a fight anymore about being a lesbian. They didn't, they were not surprised about it, which I think is a good sign because it means that these younger generations take it much more for granted than my own generation. And also the female leadership, they thought, well, it's, it's not a big issue. Whereas for my generation, it was a huge issue. I thought it was a, 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 because it definitely in Belgium, it was the first big activist movement that was led by a woman whose topic was not feminism. Because of course we've had female leaders, but then it's always about feminism or women's issues that they do activist things. But this was the first time in Belgium that there was an activist movement the, the topic was not feminism and it was led by uh, a woman and not even women, you know, girls. They, they were 17, not even finishing high school. Interestingly enough, the reaction we got from men was, um, was both positive and negative. We got some really good reactions from public figures, authors. Uh, in the pictures here, you see on the left side, that's uh, David van Rijbroek. He's one of the best known authors in Belgium who openly supported Anuna and came to all the marches. On the right pictures, you see uh, Professor Van Ipersel, who is a vice president of the IPCC, of the United Nations, the climate uh, panel. He also marched together with her. They joined her and they were male allies in a very positive way. The leadership exhibited a lot of girl power the whole time, and it was fantastic to see you because it was so refreshing and new. And here in the picture, you see Anuna next to her, one of my sisters, and then my mother in the wheelchair, who unfortunately passed away now in the corona crisis. She's uh, 86, but in 2019, she could still attend uh, the, the, the climate marches. And it was an incredibly powerful image. And everybody continued to talk about this, how powerful it was to have these girls uh, standing there in the front and leading the, 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 the movement. Right from the start, boys joined who wanted to take uh, uh, and they did not want join to take over the movement. And this was also very interesting because as a gender expert, I was very much afraid that quickly boys would step in, you know, and try to push the, the, their way to the top of the movement. Uh, they didn't, although afterwards we, there were some uh, power struggles uh, going on, um, but, but definitely not in the beginning. And I thought that was also something very new coming from a generation that I have to see boys who were very willing to step in a march that was led by, by girls. Um, and then, of course, there was the whole media, because we got the media from the whole world uh, on our doorstep, because Anuna was the first one in Europe to make this thing, this Fridays for Future, really big, with like thousands of students walking out of school. Belgium was the first. And so what does this do with a young girl? Well, of course, there's a huge media pressure, constant stress and exhaustion. We had camera crews following us the whole time, making documentaries, and it definitely changes all the relationships in the family, especially with her twin sister, because uh, Anuna is actually um, a part of a, an identical uh, twin. And you see in the middle picture, uh, her with her twin sister. Uh, then there was a crisis when one of the ministers, the conspiracy started then, the attacks to the movement. And the, the woman in the picture is, used to be the, ministry of, the minister of environment. And at a certain point in a speech, she claimed that Anuna had built a conspiracy against her and that this conspiracy was confirmed by the intelligence, Belgian intelligence, police forces. So a press release had to be made by the Pe Belgian intelligence uh, services to say that no, there was no conspiracy. They had not communicated about this to the minister and consecutively the minister had to resign, which was really 
also again big headline news. So the, the movement remained headline news uh, all through January to uh, May. And we had, you know, all kinds of things evolving like that. Then Greta came to visit Brussels, which was obviously a fantastic moment when they finally met and sat together and talked. And I'm just sharing some pictures here that I took myself from that wonderful day. Um, you see mostly girls here facing the world. Uh, you see the, the world press was gathered there on the right side, the girls and on the left side, uh, uh, which were all images which are so new, you know, it's we've we had never seen a movement in the world where the world press would gather to listen to young girls. Uh, that, that was, I think, a, a very unique new thing to see happening. Um, yeah, I want to share this picture because that, that was one of my personal favorite moments. We were taken by a little bus from the European Parliament where they had done their speech. And then uh, Greta really wanted to join one of them the protest marches in Brussels through the streets, because obviously in Sweden, she didn't do that. She was just out on her own in front of the parliament. And this is the moment when Greta all of a sudden saw, saw these 10,000 people standing there waiting for her to arrive to start the march. And you can see the happiness on her face. It was a beautiful moment. This is during that march um, next to Anuna, uh, the two of them on a bench being interviewed. Uh, and then the next day they went to Paris. They did a huge march in Paris. Uh, you, maybe you will uh, recognize some of these scenes because they're also in Greta's movie. Um, one of the activities that Anuna did as well was to build, uh, to ask the scientists in Belgium and the, the top scientists on all policy fields to jointly create a climate plan. This has been pu published in Dutch and in French, and you can find the link to that plan below. They volunteered to do this. So all these scientists, they devoted a lot of their free time to do this. And I thought it was fantastic because these scientists are mainly gray old men and they were really positively involved in the movement and they did it for free. And they, it was a fantastic way how they could be allies of this. And this is a climate plan to make a suggestion to the government on everything they need to do. Uh, here are some pictures again of, of strategic uh, lunches among uh, some of the girls. Uh, Luisa Neubauer is also there from Germany. Uh, this is me talking to Greta's father, which was also fantastic that I had. We, we started to get together as parents to support each other in, in this uh, overwhelming year. Um, this is also one beautiful moment when they had a quiet moment to, to themselves. Other male leaders that they got on board, one of the first male allies that they found on a political level was President Macron, who agreed to invite them. He, uh, they went to the Elysee to meet with him there. And again, they met him during uh, uh, in Romania. You see on the left picture, uh, Anuna there with uh, talking to Macron. And inspired by the girls, Macron achieved actually to convince nine other heads of state to meet with the girls, uh, which is really fantastic. And I keep on saying the girls, but it's really not a prerogative or negative word that I use because I think nowadays girls is one of the most powerful word, word in the in the world and it's because of their movement and and so Macron convinced nine other heads of states and interestingly enough during this meeting in in Romania Angela Merkel which is one of the female leaders walked past the girl she, she wasn't yet um, um, uh, she didn't agree yet to meet with them and Macron and mostly the men were which was I thought was really interesting uh, later on, uh, Merkel changed her mind and she was on to it. And this really, this meeting has been one of the basic things that made the green European Green Deal happening. So it's a, it's a fantastic achievement that they did. And by the way, they spent one night and one day on a bus to get to Romania just to talk five minutes with these nine heads of state. Eh? <laughs> so so they are extremely committed. They also made contact with indigenous people. Chief Raoni came to visit them in Brussels. And then he invited them to come and visit them in the Amazon forest, which Anuna did in the fall of 2019, when she took a boat to cross the Atlantic. And she stopped over in the Amazon forest on her way to go to the COP meeting in Chile. But then the COP meeting in Chile was transferred to Madrid, as some of you might uh, remember, but she visited him. Indigenous people getting them on board was also very important. And also they thought it was fantastic to meet up with the girls. 
Um, so, and then she, Aluna received uh, a number of prizes for her work and some of them, you know, on a Belgian level, but uh, three out of those four prizes were never given to a woman or especially not a young woman, which I thought also was a huge achievement and breaking glass ceilings. Then social and on social media, because of course we received a huge amount of harassment. And for those of you who have been in this seminar right from the beginning, you have seen it, we, we got trolls trying to join us here. Well, we've had trolls like that trying to uh, bash our family for the whole year of 2019. It was really horrible. And you see, um, you know, one of the messages, for example, on social media, but we received thousands of those, eh, was one guy who said, Oh my God, there's two of them. When he discovered that Anuna had an identical twin sister and then somebody replied, luckily, luckily there are two barreled guns, you know, planning to shoot both of them down at the same time. So we got murder uh, threats. We People were threatening to put bombs wherever Anuna would be speaking. So we would have police uh, uh, outside the door posted. Uh, we needed to have uh, escape cars during uh, the manifestations so that she could be evacuated by the police in case of an attack. There was uh, um, uh, the, the, She had a, a, a police trail in civil clothes uh, for protection during the, the protests. Um, it was, uh, we got specific police protection. We were attacked in every possible imaginable way, you know, up to receiving envelopes with dog shit and stuff like that. Um, here's some more of that, uh, that we, a lot of the attacks that we got also, interestingly enough, was very sexualized. Like the first uh, uh, example here, somebody who writes, she should be raped by a nigger dick, then she'll know that she's a girl, referring to the non-binary identity that Anuna has. So a lot of that, and that's also a big difference with male climate activists, they might be attacked for being climate activists, but not very often are they sexualized, sexually attacked. So it was incredible the amount of dick pics that Anuna received and how many people said that she should be raped and sexually harassed. So here's some more of these uh, uh, examples, which obviously is, uh, is, is not a very good uh, uh, thing to, to go through and very, very intimidating to go through. I'm going to finish now. I've, I've spoken more than enough and I will uh, stop sharing my screen green um stop share here um so uh these are are so there's the positive story of the wonderful male allies that we had uh which were wonderful to have but obviously not uh, uh, also some adversaries which were horrible to tackle with now um they couldn't be here in person today with us anuna will definitely try to join in some of the future seminars, but they have sent both of us a message and uh, Lakshman will be sharing that now with us. So first we get a message from Anuna, short video, and then from Greta. Hi, my name is Anuna de Wever. I'm a climate activist from Belgium, Fridays for Future, and I'm also an intern in the European Parliament. I've been an activist for over two years. I started the climate strikes in Belgium and I did this because I realized that the climate crisis is the biggest existential threat that humanity has ever faced. I know that if we don't take a step back and if we don't realize what we are doing to this planet, everyone will suffer from it. But unfortunately, the climate crisis is not equal either. There are people on the front lines right now having to face the worst effect of climate change, where there are also people like me in Europe, privileged from a middle-class family that are able to fight for their future and not their current lives. This is why it's so important that everybody gets engaged because everybody should bear the responsibility of fighting the climate crisis because it will affect everybody. I hope we can stand in this fight together because we're gonna need you. We have scientists for climate, we have youth for climate, we have workers for climate, we have teachers for climate, we even have grandparents for climate. This is not about generations, this is not about gender, this is not about ethnicity or sexual orientation. Everybody needs to unite. So I'm looking forward to seeing you in the March. And then we have a message from Greta. <laughs> Okay. Hi, I want you to come and support the strike because you should think of your children and grandchildren and what the future they are going to have. And you should take a responsibility and do everything for them. 
<laughs> Thank you. Okay, great. Uh, so those are messages from the two girls. I saw in the chat somebody would like the videos to be shared, and I don't think that's a problem at all to make a, a, a link and maybe share it in in the in the chat. Um, and if it uh, um, cannot be done right now, then maybe we can make it available through the app uh, the, of the Ubuntu Symposium. Um, uh, then uh, next, um, I would like um, to invite Martin Hultman. Uh, and I hope he's already here because he was also involved in another seminar. And, and uh, so he could only join us later on. And I don't know if he has joined us in the room. Uh, yes, Martin is there. I can see him wave. Welcome, Martin. So Martin is a professor at a university, university in Stockholm, Sweden. He uh, studies climate denialism, but he also has a lot of expertise on masculinity and gender. So that's the perfect combination for us to have here in our first seminar today. And he has done uh, 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 research on this climate denialism and all of that. So Martin, please go ahead. We, we love to hear you. Thank you. Um, first, I must say that uh, Katrin and, and uh, the work that Anuna and Greta is doing together with all of the youth leaders, not least girls and women, uh, it's uh, both, um, it, it, it is. Uh, touching deep emotions uh, with me, uh, both extremely motivated uh, and inspiring, uh, but also um, grief and uh, sadness. Um, uh, all of those type of emotions that are connected to our existential crisis. And um, uh, I do think that those who are working with it um, the climate uh, crisis um, as researchers um, and do not understand and take into account their own and others' emotions connected to this, this in addition to the material and economic and, and other issues, um, uh, do not, uh, uh, have not really opened up to to what type of issue this is. Um, so I'm happy to work with um, uh, Vida and uh, you all here in, in Men Engage uh, on trying to understand and uh, trying also to uh, create educations and leadership training to be able to deal with this issue as a masculinities issue um, also, both in positive aspect as Anuna said um, this affects us all and we all need to be part of, of the solutions here uh, but also with um, critical analysis of those um, not least elder men uh, who abuse and attack uh, these uh, young uh, female leaders of the climate justice movement as you uh, so um, this uh, uh, visually shown uh, showed uh, Catherine. So, okay, my research into this area <coughs> is um, both historically. So, I've studied the pattern of uh, this type of abuse um, uh, since uh, decades back. Um, we know that, for example, Rachel Carson, who started, uh, who has is been recognized to start the modern environmental movement with her book, um, uh, Silent Spring. She was attacked uh, and uh, she was dismissed and she was marginalized, uh, not least by, by males, uh, elder males in politics and, and science. Um, this also happened to um, women leaders uh, in Sweden during the 1970s and 1980s, who led the uh, anti-nuclear movement at that time. Um, uh, the last time, I would say, in which um, uh, women uh, uh, 
were leaders in an ecofeminist struggle. Um, I totally agree with you, Katrien, that we have not seen women leadership on this level and in this uh, way that we have that the, the, the youth mob. Uh, uh, mobilization is taking place right now uh, but the last time we saw at least traces of it was when ecofeminist um, uh, also criticized the modern industrial civil society and not least anti the, the nuclear power in the late 1970s uh, but this is in a total new level and as you say with a with a, a clarity and with um, an idea that uh, this is just needed to be done that has not been seen before. But I don't, <clears throat> and then I've studied the climate uh, change debate and especially uh, groups <clears throat> spreading doubt about climate science and uh, different types of climate change denial. And uh, I can see that today uh, <clears throat> spreading doubts about climate science is overlapping also with anti-feminist movements uh, and not least connected to the far right and uh, conservative movements. And um, we have seen how they are overlapping uh, in uh, Europe, uh, in Sweden, and in the US with the Trump administration and Bolsonaro as well. Um, so it's a phenomena, this overlapping between anti-feminism and, and climate change denial. Uh, that we have, that we are seeing all over the globe. Um, we can also see, as you said, Katrin, uh, alliance uh, building by uh, males. So we can see that uh, the youth-led climate justice movement has also kind of connected uh, to the hearts of, of elderly males and opened up them. I would say to actually take a stand and to, to be more brave and to, to be more um, clear in their support for climate justice uh, lately. There's also a research into this. Um, I myself have has written a bit about Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, which I kind of dismissed uh, uh, a decade ago because he was just um, greenwashing via technologies and didn't want any system changes. But um, it was kind of amazing to see him being supportive of Greta Thunberg and uh, Anuna and others in Fridays for Futures and actually taking a stand and also wanting to bring fossil fuel countries, uh, companies in front of the court and those kind of things. So we see <coughs> Uh, a development, as you so correctly pointed out, Katrin, uh, of both male uh, al uh, ally, uh, al allies here, and then we also see a big group of males who um, seems to be uh, to, that reacts in a, in a very uh, identity protective way, um, which I call industrial breadwinner masculinities. But this identity protection is, uh, or, or, or then spreading climate change denial, is of course also connected into structural issues of fossil fuel industries and coal industries and steel industries, uh, these type of industry sectors that frankly needs to be uh, dramatically transformed or uh, in many uh, aspects uh, they composted or like uh, uh, be changed totally. These type of industries that has employed so many men all over the planet for uh, so long time in industrial modernization um, probably cannot be any longer if we're going to take the climate science for real. And of course, that put pressures both on those type of companies, sectors and industries, but also those men who are CEOs uh, and, and, and earn the big money from them, but also the workers who, who are part of these sectors. So um, there's also uh, a big challenge of actually uh, making a just transition possible, changing these sectors. Um, and I think that needs to go 
uh, hand in hand by changing the way in which masculinities is portrayed and acted and, and how we understand ourselves as, as humans in connection to nature. And as you also pointed out, Catherine, the younger generation, they lead us there as well. So um, boys and young males, they are um, ahead of us older uh, men there. So we can also learn a lot from, from that generation. I think. Okay, thank you. That was short for me. Yes, okay. Thank you very much, Martin. And, and uh, I think we, we all would love to hear more of your analysis uh, and typology of, of uh, climate denials and masculinity in, in the future seminars. Um, and then let's, um, you know, as I said, there's the sad story of climate denial, but then there's also the, the beautiful stories of male allies in the climate movement. And we have the honor to have one today in the seminar, who's also from the Fridays for Future uh, movement from Bangladesh, Sohanur. Uh, and the, the most amazing thing about Sohanur is that he's not only very active in the Fridays for Future movement in Bangladesh, but he's also from an engage. So he's really... Uh, a, a perfect combination there as well. So, so how do we would love to hear from you. Thank you for giving this opportunity to me. Uh, I am Son Rahman. I am founding member of Fridays for Future Movement in Bangladesh, and I am a, uh, a change maker of SRHR project of the Men in Days uh, Alliance South Asia. So I was a child rights activist, and I was advocating for child rights, and I was uh, elected a child parliamentarian in 2010. So after that, I once um, that I was a uh, start advocating for girls' rights and also child marriage. So you know, Bangladesh is the most child marriage prone country, and half of the girls forced to child marriage before their 18th birthday. So when I start to uh, addressing child marriage, ending child marriage issues, so then I found a root cause. Uh, who is uh, linked to child marriage and poverty, and poverty linked to disaster. And then I found that disaster is linked to climate crisis and climate-induced crisis. So after that, in 2015, I was uh, attended Girls Not Bright Summit in uh, Morocco. Then I started my organization. It's Bangladesh Model Youth Parliament for more policy advocacy and empowering grassroots young people, women, and men for you know uh, to practice uh, uh, democracy in practice and parliamentary democracy in Bangladesh. So after that, to addressing climate justice issues. I start a network, it's called Youth Network Climate Justice in 2016 in a coastal city of Bangladesh, Borisal. So under this network, we connect more youth-led organization to claiming our justice in Bangladesh is uh, from island and islets uh, uh, position. So after that, uh, we host a youth-led uh, conference and uh, it's action-oriented conference and we uh, develop some capacity for the uh, uh, young people from the coastal communities and we develop a document, it's called Youth, youth Declaration. To, we ask for our local government, some we points, we ask some points for our national government and also global community that uh, uh, no more talk need action right now so it uh, was our uh, declaration on this uh, on this time so after that we bring this uh, declaration into the bangladesh parliament and started negotiation with this uh, 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 all party parliamentary group that uh, you know uh, climate is also political but all uh, all party parliamentary group they decide climate change is not only one party issues it's uh, for all par political parties issues so we should tackle this crisis combinedly together. And also women parliamentarian, they also express solidarity with us. In our declaration, we declared that we will build connection with international youth community who are fighting for uh, climate crisis, uh, climate justice in these uh, crisis issues. So after that, um, we uh, back in our coastal communities and started local level uh, campaign and also some action plan, engaging academia, engaging local government. So then, uh, uh, and also when uh, Greta Thunberg is, uh, you know, uh, already uh, Katrin shared about Greta Thunberg. Greta Thunberg is a Swedish, you know, uh, a teenager or girls who started skipping a school in Friday for 
her future and then it's spread all over the world and a uh, Fridays for Future Sweden uh, activist connect me to express solidarity. So when we saw at first in a news media, also television that one girls in road for, from Western country for uh, uh, stopping uh, um, climate crisis. So then we feel we should start now to express solidarity with these girls because we are innocent victim. We, our country's uh, emission rate only 0 0.03, but uh, we killed by climate crisis every year with super cyclone, with cyclone, with flood, with salinity, with in amid COVID-19, it's a you know, global emergencies, but we also faced amid COVID-19, is super cyclone, Ampan, and deadly flood. So we are tackling, we are dealing with triple crisis. But our country is not developed country, not more industrialized country. But and also climate crisis is not neutral to rich and poor. Climate crisis is not neutral to men and women. So then we express solidarity with the uh, Fridays for Future and we set up Fridays for Future movement in Bangladesh uh, chapter. Then we start fighting. But uh, in a uh, previous session, like uh, my colleague Jimita or uh, Vader, they, they, you were mentioning about global south and north. But with this, uh, with this uh, movement, we change the narrative. No global south, no global north. It's polluters and most affected communities and people. Now Fridays for Future is uh, talking, uh, its uh, title is MAPA, most affected peoples and communities. But in first time, Fridays for Future was addressed is stopping fossil fuel. We also express solidarity with stopping fossil fuel, but we also demanded, demanded more justice for our most affected peoples. We promised climate finance because Western countries and indigenous countries also promised for uh, climate finance and to uh, enhancing adaptive capacity for our women and girls, for adaptive resilience for our women and girls. But they're not keeping their promise to cutting emission. They're not keeping their promise to giving climate finance. And climate finance is not loan. Climate finance is not charity. Climate finance is not donation. Climate finance is compensation. So they're uh, betraying with our present Western, our government, our global leaders, global leaders are also betraying about our future. So then uh, we started a petition to our prime minister to declaring climate emergency in Bangladesh. We also massive strike movement and also to send letter to our prime minister through local government and also host a mock youth parliament in Bangladesh coastal Borishal city to declare and we pass this bill and send the draft bill to Prime Minister. So after that, when I was in ICPD 25 conference in Nairobi, surprisingly, I heard Bangladesh Parliament taken a motion. It's called not only climate emergency, it's also planetary emergency. And planet, planetary emergency means also focusing on climate emergency, also foca fo focusing on ecosystem, also focusing on biodiversity. So it was a, uh, a landmark victory for uh, Fridays for Future movement and youth movement because government considered our demand, our voice. Sometimes we believe government is not hearing us. And also fighting against government or government decision is very risky in Bangladesh because our, uh, uh, you know, democracy is a space is a, is a shortened but government first time one issue declared with their parliamentary uh, parliamentary decision that it's a planetary emergency but when they taken planetary emergency declaration other hand government started 29 new coal based power plant in the coastal area in the close to mangrove bonds, uh, forest sundarbon also the largest of ocean is the, you know, Cox's Bazar cities, close to cities. So there are also Rampal power plant, my uh, colleague mentioned, Rampal, Matarbari, many destructive projects they taken. So then we start again in amid COVID-19, fighting on, on through online strike with Fridays Future, stop fossil fuel funding, and not, on, not only focusing on our government, 
also focusing on the Japan, India, and Germany, who are in the behind. They are legally binded through Paris, Paris Agreement, but they are uh, indirectly funding Bangladesh to promoting coal. So then, in uh, before uh, two months ago, Bangladesh uh, Parliamentary Standing Committee decided to phase out all coal waste power plant because this donor country is not investing coal now, and coal is not now cheaper. It's go going to the uh, high price and we also negotiation with many countries who are uh, who are influencing our pol climate policy climate agenda like uk is the uh, presidency of cop 26 upcoming cop which will be glasgow and also netherlands who is supporting our delta plan so we also use climate negotiation with them so i think we cannot achieve climate justice without gender justice we cannot achieve gender justice with climate justice is a totally linked but why linked when i was started my child marriage activity uh, pro, uh, uh, preventing child marriage activity i was seen that when disaster hit people want to cope this these people can cope poor people poorest people cannot cope the unfortunate coping mechanism for them is child marriage to cutting their burden it's totally linked climate crisis and also uh, we linked with the maternal mortality with the connection with the saline water we, we we have also found also science proven this also we found the uh, miscarriage the pregnant mother uh, preg baby killed in pregnancy time it's miscarriage in for this uh, salinity or uh, saline water so and in movement or decision making or and also all the decision making is dominated by male and this crisis is made by man-made crisis this total crisis is man-made and they are taking decision so in decision making level Women participation, youth participation, girls' participation is very low to end this process. So male already engaged, but there is not with a good thinking to caring to our women, to care our planet. They are destroying, they're destroying our planet. Also, they are harming to our women and girls. So we need caring leaders. We need caring uh, men to this climate negotiation or this, and also increasing participation of women and girls in this process. Women and youth can fix out this, but they're not giving a space in the global negotiation and global dialogue about this. So it's my perce perception. And you know, today is a very important day is a human rights day. And human, for climate crisis, our people are losing human rights. They're dying and our ecosystem also collapsing for this crisis. So uh, in 12 December, is the five years anniversary of Paris Agreement. But our capitalist countries who are global leader, who are pa practice patriarchy or male domination, they're not doing enough to protect our planet. So through this uh, session, through this meeting, we, we young people from most affected countries like Bangladesh urging our global leader to more enhance their ambition to cutting emission. Without cutting emission, we cannot save our planet. Also, we should focus caring lens to decision making and engage men and youth. It's my demand for this session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sohanu. What a passionate speech. Uh, very inspiring to listen to you. Yes, and, and good luck with everything that you're doing in, in Bangladesh which is really so essentially important. And, and, and I think you very well expressed the link between the gender movement and the climate justice movement. I'm giving the word back to Vidar now to close the session because it's already 10 to four, I see. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Sohanur, and thank you everybody. Uh, and luckily this is all recorded so you can listen to it again and again. Um, you have so much to say, Sohanor, and it's so important, everything that's there. And, and sometimes it's so fast, I can't really grasp it all, but it's good to know I can look at the recording uh, again and again to, to find all the nuances there. Thank you, everybody, so much. Um, I will share my screen again. Um, and thank you. Catherine for 
co-hosting with me in this. Um, okay, so uh, again, we will not have time to go into small breakout rooms, unfortunately, but we will instead go see if I can share this now. Um, this question again, what do I feel and think when I listen to Katrin, Anuna, Greta, Martin and Suhano? Sorry, I spelled your name wrong there, Suhano. What happens in me when I care about this? Please write in the chat. Just something, the first thing that comes to your mind or your heart. 20 seconds. Thank you. So I'll talk a little bit about the series that we have now in front of us. We do actually have something for the next session, which is February 25th. It's the launch of the book, Men, Masculinities and Earth, that is um, edited by Martin Hultman and Paul Poulet, together with a lot of forefront uh, researchers and activists in the world. Um, so we will hear from all the contributors to that book in this um, seminar, the February 25th. But then as you see, we left the some empty here in between to hear your thoughts on what would you like us to deepen in these seminars. So I give that question to you now. Please write in the chat ideas for what you would like included in the series. It can be something that you've heard about today or something else you think about. I'll give you one minute to write something about that. <clears throat> Thank you very much. And this is special. I, re I really wanted to invite us to be in small groups and talk to each other and hear each other and develop the thoughts together. But we do it this way instead. It works fine too. A lot of great ideas here. Thank you so much. Um, please keep filling, on, filling in. We move, I move to the next slide. <laughs> Uh, 
Oh, here comes my daughter. Some girl power here. <laughs> Nora. <laughs> here is um, a little teaser for the new book coming. Men, Masculinities on Earth, Contending with the Nantropocene. And that's, the, that's our next seminar. I also want to share a little bit about the parallel deeper group, group process that is possible to join as well, if you want. This is a material that we developed uh, men together with Chalmers, with Martin Hultmann and Paul Poulet, and together with the garden uh, at Undertalano and other important persons like Abigail Saikis, who is also with us here now today, um, and others. Um, and it's it's two materials. The first one is the After Me, After Me Two, reflective groups for men that men developed when about thousand men came to our organization when they realized the magnitude and um, with men's sexual sexualized violence against women with the Me Too. And then we on to that material which is focusing on on the human relationships and how masculinity norms are 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 causing problems there and how men can can step step up and take responsibility and and make change we added uh, the other material men in the climate crisis which then builds on that and includes also the environment and the climate and how how the the, um, the same masculinity norms and patriarchal structures also are root causes for the environmental crisis and climate change and how we as men can can look at how masculinity norms are important parts of this and how we can change and what are we really longing for how can we create the relationships with humans and with nature that where we connect again where we belong where we're not in this triangle and separated and and over um, this will be possible to join um, from january to june and we are still deciding if it's going to be five or eight sessions you can choose which sessions to to pick um, so we'll soon give the dates for that it will be multi-language uh, as now so it's possible to join in, if you speak any of the languages we speak here today and you can join either as a participant or as a facilitator or a co-facilitator and we will organize a training of trainers in, in january so i would like you now to put for the very last minute wow it's already time now but for the very last minute right in the chat um something about what you bring with you, with you from today and your contact information if you want to take part in the deeper process with the with the guide for reflective groups um, and there also please specify if you if you want to join as a facilitator co-facilitator or participant um, Yes. And while you do that, I just want to thank you all from the bottom of my heart to all the co-creating organizations and to all you speakers and to all interpreters that have helped us with the language so we can understand each other and for all of you participants for today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And see you again soon. Thank you.